Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. What is love? I invite you to take a few deep breaths in and a few deep breaths out. What does love mean to you? Love has many definitions. The one that I want to hold up today is this. Love as a noun, deep commitment or connection to someone or something or someplace. Love as a verb, to give an assurance of this affection. What does love look like? If you close your eyes, and think of love, what do you see? I did a Google image search of love in preparing for this sermon and the entire first page, I didn't go beyond the first page, was overwhelmed with images of hand-holding, hugging, and kissing. All different types of people, all different ages. Hand-holding, hugging, and kissing. Living through a pandemic brings so much fear. One of the greatest sources of fear is that that love will be lost. And if we think of love as only being able to be expressed in these physical ways, no wonder we are scared. We are scared we will lose love. We are scared our children won't remember love or won't learn to love. And we are scared that love will be lost in some way for our future. There is loss, there is change, and we have to grieve that. But even with what is lost, I don't think love is lost. I don't think love will be lost. I think love is around us in beautiful new ways. And I want to take you with me on a tour through one workday of mine to show you what I see love to look like. I work as an interfaith chaplain at one of our Boston hospitals where I serve mostly on the adult intensive care units. Very few of my colleagues, really if any, know what Unitarian Universalism is or know what my ministry looks like outside of the hospital but they now know that I sometimes lead worship or preach sermons because for weeks I've explained that I really need to get out on time to write my sermon that's coming up. Weeks pass, I never quite got out on time. But what I saw around me as I was staying late and not writing my sermon was really my living sermon. So I'd love to take you through just one day at the hospital And I'll take care to point out all of the areas where I saw love in this place where everyone is extra careful to not extend physical touch unless vital to a patient's health. As I do with any time I I preach about my work to ensure confidentiality for the patients, the loved ones, and the staff that I get to walk beside, I've changed all of the identifying details in my stories, but I've worked to keep the essence of who the people are and what happened. So to start us with this day, I'm getting ready for work. I read articles on my phone as I brush my hair and brush my teeth and pick out my outfit. And I see an article about a Palestinian man who climbs the hospital wall to his mom's hospital room sitting on the window perch to be close to her while she is treated for COVID. Jihad al Suwidi sits outside his mom's room every day, watching her 
until she passes away. My day starts reading his message of love. I arrive at the hospital and as I head to my office, I see paper hearts everywhere, taped to walls and to windows. Each is different, some a solid color, others with a drawing or a handwritten message. They come from children and adults near and far, meant to offer encouragement and support to the staff serving our hospital and the patients who are here. I see messages of love. I go to one of my units to check on Tom, who is very sick and not improving after a procedure. Tom can look around, but he can't talk. His family met with our team and cried as they said they worry that Tom's care, sorry, Tom's care team will not understand how loved he is, that he has a whole life before he was in the hospital and that he might think they aren't thinking of him because right now our visiting hours are very restricted. As I walk into Tom's room, I see something new. Our copy center and our IT team has made a poster for him. The poster is full of pictures his family sent in. The biggest photo is of his beloved dog. The poster lets everyone know that Tom loves old Western movies, he loves country music, and he is entirely devoted to his dog, Chico. This poster is full of love. When I go to another unit, I hear the start of an unmistakable song blasting out of a room. Is this real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. I raised my eyebrow to Alex, one of our physicians, Oh, that's for Mr. C, he says with a smile. His husband and kids let us know that Queen is his best medicine. Apparently, he and his husband love it. And when they took the kids on road trips, it was Queen only ride. No other music allowed. Sounds fun. We've been singing along. I hope Mr. C knows he's got the whole unit bumping. This is clearly the sound of love. I go deeper into the unit to our conference room where a group of us is meeting with the family of one of our patients. In this family meeting, we give an update and ask difficult questions about what to do next. Our patient April can't speak for herself. So her daughter, sister, and boyfriend join us by phone and tell us all about April. They tell us how much they love April, how much everybody loves April. After the meeting, one of our techs, Hattie, brings in an iPad and pulls the family up on FaceTime where they express that same love to April. After I leave the family meeting, our clinical leader tells me there is lunch in the staff lounge. The group gathers around a table full of sandwiches and salads and cookies. What's this, I say. Read the note. The note reads, Dear healthcare workers, thank you so much for all you do for your patients. Our mom was on your unit, and we are so grateful for all you did for her, all you did for everyone. Since we can't come in to thank you, we wanted to send you a good meal, and we hope you feel our love and thanks. We ate and rested and felt the love. After many more pages and visits and phone calls, it is late, and I have not written one word of my sermon. I need to make one last delivery. I stop by our unit and see our leader, Daphne, our nursing leader, Daphne. I've got socks for you, she says. I've got a decorated bag, I say, showing a bag decorated with pictures of mountains that we know our patient Josephine loves. Josephine is managing too many health issues to count. I never thought this is what life would be like, she told us. I just can't live like this anymore. It feels impossible. Josephine's body is no longer in terminal danger, but her mind and her heart are. Josephine told us that she loves the hospital socks and that 
while most patients grumble about wearing them, she takes them home, washes them, and uses them on her slippery floor. Daphne and I and some of the nurses made a sock care package for Josephine. Even more than the socks, we want her to know that we see her pain and we care about her. I knocked on the door to drop off our bag and I see Meg, one of our techs, sitting as close to Josephine as we can safely sit. Her head is bent towards Joe, eyes full of kindness and locked on our patient as she talks about her fears. Meg mostly listens, pausing every now and then to remind Josephine that she deserves all the love, all the patience, and all the care she can get. Josephine tells her how much the company helps. Meg says she still has time to sit and that she will visit the next day. There is incredible love in the listening. My last task of the day is to drop off a form at our main office. Oh, Allie, my colleague Eliza says, I have something for you. It's for your office. As a stress relieving exercise, and maybe because I can't shop for clothes in person, I started redecorating my office when the pandemic really peaked. Eliza emerges with a small object wrapped in tissue paper. It is a small but bright and beautiful quilt with flowing stitching weaving in and around a rainbow flag and held within a rainbow border. Eliza has been ordering beautiful handmade quilts for our units, wanting to bring beauty to our patients. I was shocked that there was a quilt for me. In our conversations, I had told Eliza that part of why I became a chaplain was because the religious leaders that I had growing up told me that because of who I loved, there was no place for me. No place for me in our church and definitely no place for me in heaven. I wanted to create spaces of love and care in places where there was pain and fear and loss. I, I just thought Eliza's words interrupted my thoughts I just thought you'd do so much to include others, and I thought of you when I saw this. I could preach many sermons on how powerful this act of love was for me. There is incredible love in this giving. As I was packing up and changing out of my clothes and into sweats to walk to my car, my phone rang. Hi, Al, Marg said. I live with Marg and her husband. I just wanted to make sure you are okay. I know you had planned to leave early to work on your sermon and it's really late and just wanted to make sure that you're all right. There is love in this phone call. In our message for all ages, we followed the love that children sometimes get to experience and the love that we hope all children experience. We saw how love can be a big hug, but love can also be burnt toast Love can be made up stories. Love can be guitar chords. In just this one day at the hospital, I saw how love can be sitting on a window perch, how love can be paper hearts, how love can be a poster, how love can be talking, how love can be music, how love can be lunch, how love can be socks, how love can be listening, how love can be a quilt, and how love can be a phone call. Where do you see love in your life? Is there love around you that you don't recognize? Are there new places to look, new things to see? And not only where do you see love in your life, but how do you give love? How could you give love? Reverend Dr. Chapman is the psychologist and pastor who created the five, lung, lo, sorry, five love languages, which is a philosophy that looks at the ways that we both show and receive love. Chapman believes that we can show 
and or receive love in words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, quality time, and physical touch. As the pandemic peaked, Chapman said in an interview, the deepest need we have as humans is to feel love by the significant people in our lives. If we feel loved, life is beautiful in spite of problems we might face. If we don't feel loved, life begins to feel pretty dark. So it's important whether we're going through crisis or not going through crisis. Keeping love alive in a relationship is important, whether it's a marriage or a dating relationship or a friendship or a relationship with children. The need for love is consistent with our human nature. Our desire to love and be loved does not change in a pandemic. And there are many ways to show and receive love. Looking at expressing love in these categories might offer more vantage points for thinking through how we might express our love. Physical touch is the expression of love that has been temporarily eliminated from so many of our relationships. It can be important to make time to hold the people that are in our bubbles, the people we are still seeing face to face. But we don't all have that. And if we don't have people in our bubbles that we feel comfortable touching or holding, we can hold ourselves, holding our hands together or putting a hand over our heart are ways to show love to ourselves and to offer ourselves the comfort of physical touch even in a pandemic. Words of affirmation become especially important when physical touch is not possible. In our Western culture, it can feel uncomfortable to directly say what we're feeling, but the pandemic can be a time to challenge ourselves to say what we, re what we might usually rely on action to show. An example could be instead of giving a friend who is sad a hug, saying something like, I care about you so much. It is hard to not be able to give you a hug and to hold you. All the sentiment of a hug, love, support, concern, connection. I am feeling all of that for you right now. And I want you to know that even if I can't hug you, I love you, I support you, I'm concerned for you and I feel connected to you. I'm here. There is so much need and so many opportunities to help, especially now. We might not be able to collaborate in service projects or spend time with people we seek to help, but we can find ways to make our care personal, even if we can't physically be with someone Instead of taking our neighbor grocery shopping, we can pick up groceries for them and we can leave a letter with their groceries. This letter can be seen as another love language, gift giving. Many of us are experiencing loneliness during the pandemic, missing our work colleagues, our families, our friends, or just strangers that we're used to seeing. Quality time might look different, but it is desperately needed. All of us right now are spending quality time together, even if it's different. And it's such a gift. Scheduling FaceTime or Zoom, writing texts or emails or even handwritten letters, meeting someone for a socially distant walk or a wave outside. These are great expressions of quality time. Matt De La Pena dedicated his book, Love, the story that we began with. He dedicated this to his parents for a lifetime of love. A lifetime is a long time. Love can take many forms, reaching us in all kinds of ways. 
in this time when the pandemic forces us to show love in different ways. I ask you to remember that love is still here and to be thinking about what love looks like for you. It can be scary to not have our ordinary ways of showing and receiving love. But when we can't access the ordinary, we have an opportunity to find extraordinary. May this time that brings us away from the known and the usual give us an opportunity to break open love, letting love come to us in new forms and new colors. And may love's persistence in a pandemic, may this persistence be an incredible reminder of how holy and how powerful love is. Blessed be and amen. I invite you to engage in the love language of touch, placing a hand over your own heart or putting your hands up, virtually touching the hands of those in the squares next to you. Our benediction today comes from the epilogue of the musical Les Miserables. Take my love, for love is everlasting, and remember the truth that once was spoken to love another person is to see the face of God. Friends, the service begins where the service ends. Go in peace and find love all around you. Amen. Where you go, where you go, I will go be loved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.